So we've started to put a mathematical framework around this by modeling, and oddly enough, it's never really been modeled, by looking at what normal cells will be doing in terms of shedding biomarkers, what tumor cells will be doing in terms of shedding biomarkers, starting to build simple mathematical models that help us understand, based on what fraction of biomarkers enter the blood, what really uh, is the probability of being able to detect a tumor of a certain size from a simple blood-based assay. Now, there's many assumptions in this, but the models give us a framework to start testing what variables we have to begin to understand, what variables, in fact, are not known to us that will then guide future experimentation. And, in fact, although I don't have time today, I just want to show you that these models are starting to now give us semi-quantitative agreement with what we do know, which is what happens in recurrence of tumor, with biomarkers that are more well characterized because there's so few real biomarkers of early detection, but biomarkers of recurrence do agree with what our model predictions are finding. We're able to see that these models are supporting that less than a cubic millimeter of tumor volume somewhere in your body is potentially detectable through a blood test. So it's not an unrealistic problem, and it's not that a cubic centimeter of tumor has to exist. A cubic millimeter, and in some case, even 0.1 cubic millimeters of tumor can be detected under optimal conditions. And one of the key optimal conditions, as you might suspect, is the specificity of that biomarker, that the normal cells are not making hardly any, if any, of the same protein that the tumor is making. And of course, um, if we can develop blood assays and have biomarkers that are extremely specific and are only being shed by the tumor, then we can potentially even push the boundaries of detection to lower levels. And we even are using that to guide our technology development, as I'll show you, about new generations of assays that can detect lower and lower levels of blood proteins. So these modeling results, although depicted here qualitatively, are covered in that paper are very important because they put a mathematical framework around the problem. They tell us that the problem of early detection is approachable, what tumor sizes are likely to be possible to detect, and therefore give us confidence that we can actually potentially make this work uh, from the in vitro side. Now, one of the things the modeling led us to was this concept of how do we get tumors to shed biomarkers faster without having to wait for the tumor to grow. Because ideally, I would take a blood test from you and then do something to you and retake the blood test so that you serve as your own control, so we take out some of the variability of protein biomarkers in this case, and not have to wait for months to years while the tumor continues to grow to be sure that you actually have a possible tumor hidden somewhere in your body. And one of the things that, that, that we've been able to do is literally show that by yelling at someone, we can cause their blood biomarkers to go up. Now, as strange as that sounds, in fact, the heart of it is at the basis that we know we can use sound to increase delivery into the cell. For example, gene therapy, in fact, can be enhanced by using sound. So we've been studying different strategies in sound delivery to tumor sites to, in fact, allow this shedding to occur. And this seems very strange at first, because you say, does that really work? And in fact, yes, it does work. In animal models where you apply sound to animals that don't have tumor at all, you will not see a bump up of a given biomarker or even a panel of biomarkers. But if you apply the sound in an animal that has a tumor, but to the wrong site, where the sound does not have a chance to interact with the tumor, again, you will not have an increase in biomarker. But if you apply the sound to areas that have tumor, even if you didn't know that area had a tumor, you will, of course, start to see this bump up in biomarkers. Now, we've initially validated this in xenograft models and now in transgenics, and are moving this into a clinical trial that I'll show you. But it opens up the possibility of being able to literally stress the tumor environment. The mechanisms seem to be related to micropores that then, in fact, disappear after just a few hours. 
It is not through enormous cell death, although, of course, if you deliver higher energy sound, you will cause a lot of cell death at that site as well. But we're continuing to study this, and in fact, if you look at the y-axis, which is the bump up, if there's an area of no tumor, you hover around zero. And then there's a lot of variability, because we don't fully understand how the sound interacts with different areas within the tumor bed itself. But we're starting to get a good handle on this, enough now so that we've been able to reproduce this across multiple biomarkers and multiple tumor models, and in fact, have a way of moving it into a clinical trial. You may know in the clinics there are new technologies focused on sound called high-intensity frequency ultrasound, or HIFU, which instead of radiation therapy are being used to deliver sound locally in order to, in this case, increase the temperature of tissue to destroy the tissue. But we're intercepting the same trials to actually now go in and provide sound to a region of the body to then test whether specific biomarkers increase. And if successful, that would open up a way to test this and actually move biomarker detection into a new kind of structure. Because you wouldn't have to know where the tumor is. You could do a blood test and then apply sound, for example, to the left breast, redo the blood test, then apply sound to the right breast and redo the blood test. There are many caveats to this. Of course, there's many reasons it may fail. But it's just to get everyone thinking that we have to come at this uniquely by trying to cause the equivalent of a stress test so as to get a bump up in blood biomarker levels. Now that led us to a second issue that, OK, if we could start to do this, but how do we push the limits of detection technologies where we can detect very small changes in protein in the blood and also um, do it reliably? So we built a very tall order. We wanted true matrix insensitivity, so it wouldn't matter if it's blood or eventually saliva or cell lysates. The matrix that the proteins are in would be irrelevant. We wanted very high sensitivity, approaching low femtomolar. Based on our models, we were able to predict that that's the kind of sensitivity we would eventually want to achieve to push down even into the 0.1 millimeters cube range. And then go into a very large dynamic range so that we could detect very low-level abundance proteins and very high-level abundance proteins. This, along with a few other criteria, is a very small amounts of volume of actual blood sample, as low as 30 to 40 microliters, so that you might only have 100 to 120 copies of protein in that sample, led us to this development of technologies like the magneto nanosensor. Now, the magneto nanosensor is in its uh, second generation now, and we recently started coupling it to microfluidic platforms. But the basic concept is that a drop of blood can be processed and multiplexed for hundreds of proteins in simultaneity, but with only very small uh, actual volume of sample. The technology works as shown here. The heart of it is, again, really bringing engineering and medicine together. Richard Gaster, an MSTP student working between Sean Wang's lab in material science and my lab, um, was helping to develop this technology. The yellow sensor that you see on this slide, this is a giant magnetoresistor, the same thing that's in your hard disk drives. But this GMR is very sensitive to very small changes in magnetic fields. This GMR sensor can be coupled to antibodies antibodies that will be uh, specific for the target biomarker that you're trying to detect in the blood sample. And of course, you can lay down multiple antibodies against multiple biomarkers. And right now, the sensor wouldn't know anything's happened, because there's no change in magnetic field. But now, you come in with your blood sample, and after the biomarker, the protein is bound to your antibody, the sensor still doesn't know anything's happened. But now, much like in a sandwich format in ELISA, with a second antibody that has a very strong and sensitive magneto nanoparticle shown here, that magneto nanoparticle now can lead to a change in magnetic field locally. And the distance between this particle and the GMR controls, in fact, that sensitive change that will lead to a voltage difference uh, in the system with the GMR. And so now that magnetic field change is detected, telling you you have that antigen present. Now, simple in concept, but to build a reliable chip like this, 
that can be mass produced, multiplexed, has taken us a while, um, and in fact now is working. And we have very carefully tested it over the last couple of years in multiple applications to show that it has the kind of robustness we're looking for. Compared to an ELISA, which sits here, in terms of concentration of target uh, antigen and the uh, signal detected, this magneto nanosensor with the same two antibodies that would be used in the ELISA can now reach into a level that is not possible with optical techniques. Because of the low magnetic um, background in biological materials, you're able to, with the same binding affinities that is being used in ELISA, reach in and detect, um, in fact, uh, such low levels, and eventually we feel uh, high atomolar levels. It's also fairly reproducible. The chip-to-chip -chip variability now has a coefficient of variation of about 7%, and we think these kind of technologies can be deployed in large scale to let us start to test uh, early detection issues, which I'll get to.